Hi, everybody. I'm Chance Coble. Welcome again to another of our Ask Me Anything series. Uh, this series is on data storytelling. This is the fourth of these we've done in the series, and uh, they seem to be increasing in popularity. So I'm looking forward to doing more of these over the course of the year. Um, let's go ahead and get started on, um, on data storytelling. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to one of these, um, again, I'm Chance Coble. I'm uh, with Blacklight Solutions, a partner of Yellowfin. Uh, I've been doing uh, Yellowfin implementations for well over a decade and uh, really focusing on the uh, ISV market where I put together uh, usually white labeled and embedded Yellowfin instances for our customers that are trying to put uh, products in front of their customers, as well as doing um, direct implementations for more internal teams and um, decision support systems. So let's talk about data storytelling for a little bit. I'm, I'm going to introduce the topic here, and then after I introduce the topic, um, we'll have uh, lots of time left for questions. People have already submitted a lot of questions on this, so I'll jump into that right away. But go ahead and uh, put your questions into the chat, um, and we'll collect them and answer them as I, uh, as I come to them. So here's the big question with data storytelling. Once you have your data, once it is available for you to do data discovery on, in, or in other words, once you can get in and query it and kind of start looking at some of the patterns in it and some of the things that, the insights that you can pull out of it, how do you then share that with others in a meaningful way? Data storytelling really means you're starting from a place where you have your data organized enough to draw insights on them. You're ready to glean those insights and visualize them. But rather than just taking those visualizations and throwing them out at people, you really want to start with a narrative. You want to start with some way to say, here's the point I'm trying to make in my research on this data, and I'm going to give you an A and then B and then C, and then my conclusion is D kind of style narrative with that data. You're going to want to hit hard on those salient points around that data, and you're going to want to use those visualizations to enrich and corroborate that data. You do not want to start with the visualizations or worse, start with the data itself and see what visualizations you can make out of it and then just share those visualizations. As you're doing that, you'll wind up putting out tons of visualizations of very low value because data really will tell you all sorts of things you may or may not be curious about. But if you start with that story, if you start with the point you're trying to make, that's where you really get into um, being able to capture an audience and make a point to them that's very well supported by the evidence. You enrich your story with those visualized quantities, not the other way around. And there's a very important point that if you take one thing away from this AMA, I would really like to make about this, which is that BI is not about charts and visualizations. Saying that BI is about charts and visualizations is like saying medicine is about stethoscopes. It just doesn't make sense to look at it that way. It's a tool for the job. It is not the job itself. Take a look at this visual, and I don't mean to pick on it or pick on anyone or call anyone out here. My point is, you know, we can look at something sometimes and say, we might have done this differently if we looked at it through the lens of what we're really pulling out of this information. The pie charts in that visual are really thrown at the audience. It's very difficult to determine what the point they're trying to make here is. It's very difficult to determine exactly what decisions we might pull from this visualization. It's also tough to say, okay, now that we've seen this, how do we use it? How do we make a decision? How do we build an insight? It almost looks like raw data visualized. And that's really not what we're trying to accomplish here. What we really want to do is to create narrative, something people can follow. Remember, when you're presenting to an audience, or even if you're just sharing with an audience and it's not a presenter-led distribution, then that audience, their attention span is only going to be so great. Throwing data at them, raw data, or even just summarizing that raw data with visuals without a clear sense of the lineage of the logic you're trying to follow is not going to really work. For them. It's not really going to give them anything. They're not going to even remember what you showed them because it's too complex. You need to give people a point-by-point -point sense of what you're trying to get through to them. What is the point you're trying to make? And then corroborate that point, support it with the evidence that you have and the quantities you have available to you. This visualized data still feels raw. It doesn't really feel yet like 
something that has been turned into intelligence. And that's really the key point we're trying to make here is that we don't want to take raw data and just visualize raw data and share that with people. We want to share a clear story, a clear sense of a logical narrative with people that comes to conclusions that are well supported. Pie charts are sometimes a little bit controversial. They really went hard on pie charts on this. So I don't know, maybe you can include that in kind of the data storytelling best practices, but um, I think it's something worth pointing out that you know maybe if you were to do something like this and really throw raw data at people, you could use some other visuals as well. They use one at the bottom in terms of that histogram, but I really think that you know the key points here are that it's just even without looking at it from all the pie charts they used, um, that is a really difficult visual, a really difficult infographic to pull clear narrative out of or to draw any real conclusions from. Really getting to a great story, um, just again introducing this topic, means bringing text into that in order to support your narrative. So if you're going to distribute something to an audience, whether it's presenter-led or just automatically distributed, you really want to bring some kind of short, to the point, salient text in order to support that narrative. Now, that might mean putting some kind of headliner in there and then putting some visuals in, visuals in so people can support that and understand and really feel that there is evidence towards what you're saying. Or it might mean putting together the point you're trying to make or the subject matter you're trying to make and then having the visuals be clear enough to drive the point home. Either way, the important thing here is that you are really getting through to your audience on the points you're trying to make. It's clearly uh, um, a linear logical sequence of I'm doing this, I'm saying that, then we did this, then this happened. It is something like a story that really has very clear points. So when you build one of these, you want to start with those points you're trying to make, then go find the visuals that really back up those points. And of course, we could all contort data to say anything we want to say. Um, there's there's a famous quote about if you you know any data that's been tortured enough can can make any point. But um, you know, using best practices to make sure we're not cherry picking and that we're actually saying something honest, you really do want to start with the point and then back it up with the data you find or the insights you've pulled out of that data. So that makes the point that add those visualizations to support your narrative once you have that text in place. Now, once you have those visuals in place, it's fantastic if you can make them interactive. If you can make it so that they actually allow you to do investigation and further understanding of the insights that are generated in your story, now your story has real depth. It doesn't just have those simple points as narratives, but it also has a way for you to go in and investigate and better understand um, exactly what that data is telling you along with that narrative, aligned with that narrative. And then finally, AI has been such a hot topic with uh, auto text generation with chat, chat GPT. Um, but I think for this, there's actually a story that's a little bit separate that it can play in that, not so much in generating automatically the text that you put there, which is what's been in the news lately, but really to better drill in and understand what causes variance between categories and data, what really causes um, um, potentially change in data by looking at what changed the most that really drove those numbers. When you're building one of these stories, one of the best things you can include is here's the story I'm telling, here's the way the world changed, and here are the numbers that really drove that change. Okay, so having said all that, I'm gonna walk through a couple of features uh, in Yellowfin that I think help reify the sense of story and some tools that you can use in order to um, put together those stories. And then once I get through that, then we'll go ahead and turn it over for Q&A. And there we go. Okay. Help me out here. Anybody who doesn't see the Yellowfin dashboard in front of them, you should see that um, through the media player now. There it is. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about is that there are tools specifically in Yellowfin to help organize that, that kind of storytelling and to better include a narrative in what you're saying. One of those is 
I'll give an example with this monthly sales deck. Uh, Yellowfin's presentation feature, which allows you to put together kind of a slide-based version of what you're trying to do to present your data. So you clearly you have all the graphics potential, all of the nice editing that Yellowfin provides that gives you that kind of almost graphical design interface while also putting together data with that narrative. So here's where you're putting your text. This is much more for those points that are just gonna hit home. These are the one sentence, maybe two sentence bullet point style narrative that you wanna put alongside some kind of charts. And of course these charts are real Yellowfin reports. So you get all the same interactivity as you go through them. But notice here what they're starting with is the problem. They're saying, and this is just example data, so I'm just drawing this as how you might put this together in terms of a framework, but the challenge we first see, driven by data, followed by, here's why we had to make a change. This narrative clearly explains why this change had to happen, and you could imagine that this would be a very effective presenter-led distribution of this data story. The plan moving forward includes, here's what we did and why it increased. So we increased this marketing investment over here. And once again, I want to make the point that if you can do this in a way that's interactive, in a way that allows you to drill and better understand, it just better supports your narrative and gives depth to the story you're trying to tell. That's especially true if as a presenter, you can actually go in and interact with that data or if you distribute this directly to an audience, and this text is clear enough that I think you could do that for this kind of presentation, um, that they can actually play around with the data and really see how this breaks down and why you're making the decisions you're making as part of the story. And then here's what happened. It's a great summary. This is the last slide. This is very short, obviously, in nature. But you see, if you ever um, came across a, an author named Daniel Pink, he wrote a book called To Sell as Human. His name might be familiar because a lot of people like his book and his TED talk on uh, uh, called Drive about how people are motivated to work. But To Sell as Human has a, has a portion of it. I recommend it for everybody, by the way, not just people in sales, not just people in sales, but he has a portion in it that basically goes through one of the things you might do to try to think about the story you want to tell in a sales process anytime you're trying to persuade people is kind of this Pixar narrative of, hey, there was a problem that happened in the land. Then this happened one day. As a result, these people took certain actions, and then this was the result. Those kind of four elements of that sort of Pixar-style uh, story points are really good to think of in terms of what happened, what changed, what did people do about it, and what was the result. If you really are struggling with that blank page, that's a great formula to come up with to really start with those stories. Okay. Let's look at another Yellowfin feature. Um, for this one, actually, I think I'm going to go to this. And um, we'll start with Yellowfin Stories. Now, you get to Yellowfin Stories through the same browse function we look at in Yellowfin right here. Stories, though, are a more in-depth type of presentation. So your, your ability to go in and show a story here is or excuse me, your, your, the type of story you're going to tell when you want to share this with people is going to be a much more in-depth, long narrative type story, also with data shared with them. And the nice thing about stories is you can include any kind of media, just like with presentation. You can include um, video, you can include live reports, you can include um, images, you can include you know, links, and even natural language query results can be immediately added to a story in order to create that long form narrative. Of course, in this case, you're very unlikely to be distributing something that could be presenter-led. You're likely to be presenting something or distributing something, rather, that is a much more in-depth analysis that people are going to want to follow. That's very different than the kind of presentation we just went through, which is much more presenter-led. You assume there might be an expert presenting it or something like that, uh, actually there to answer questions from the audience, interact with the data. In this case, you're presenting it to people in a way that you're providing all of that. Um, authority, and then you're showing it to them as, uh, you know, as they want to thumb through this article. And you can see not only who's read it, you can see people that liked it, you get that kind of interactive feature. And uh, I think the only other point I want to make about this is that while it is a very uh, nice way to create a very in-depth narrative, um, this is not 
like a word desktop publishing tool. While it allows for that kind of interactive report and filtering and anything you want to include to let people really play with that data and do their own kind of discovery of insights, um, this is a much more, you know, kind of block by block kind of way of editing a, a story in a document. But it's very powerful if you're trying to create that more long form narrative. In both cases, I've seen people who are trying to go through some kind of business process um, that is a regular occurrence where they want to present data as it has been updated and they want to update their story regularly. In Yellowfin, the way that that practice is usually carried out is that you start with a story or you start with some kind of presentation and you go through and create it, create your reports for it, and then you can actually save it as that particular version. And the next time you have to present that, you can go in, create a copy, create your narrative again, and then save that. And that way people can actually see up-to-date um, uh, narratives and data on the presentation you're making so that if there's something like a board meeting or something like that that happens on a regular occasion that people need to review the same data over and over again, you can, you can go through and update that narrative and save that specific version. Now, of course, in that case, you'll want to include filters in your reports so that the timelines that the data is included for uh, represent the timelines of the data that people want to look at for that period. Using AI in order to understand what insights are there so you can more effectively do that discovery and bring that into your presentation is important. And I want to, once again, I've shown this in another Ask Me Anything, I think it's a, a great feature for avoiding a tremendous amount of analyst time investment. This ability to go in and compare two categories and have Yellowfin come back and tell you um, exactly what was driving the variance between those two categories. I've shown you this and demonstrated from the analyst perspective, someone who's really trying to find insights. But from the storyteller's perspective, this is a really powerful feature if you want to go in and say, okay, I know that these things changed, but I know that when I present this, I'm going to get asked why. I want to do a better job of being able to explain what is driving that variance and how does that contribute to my story. And for that, Assisted Insights is a very powerful feature because you can jump into um, what really, what categories within the data that we're looking at the two uh, numbers for drove variance from one to the other. And if you can see the way that data slices in such a way that it shows what drove that variance, that is a very powerful way to add an enricher story, add depth to an enricher story. Obviously, the same thing is true for Yellowfin signals. If you find a, a signal or you're monitoring a number or something like that and you really want to better understand where that number changed and use that to add depth, you can obviously go in and find other related reports which show what really, of the dimensions that contribute to that number, what really drove that spike. And that's a, a that adds great depth to your story and allows you as a presenter to not only talk through what changed and what drove decisions, but deeper down, what drove the change that you're describing. Okay. All right, so given all of that and what I've gone through to introduce the topic there, um, I'm gonna get started on some questions. go. So please go ahead and, and post your questions if you haven't already shared them uh, before the Ask Me Anything session. And uh, we already have some coming in, so I'll start answering. Should I include sentences or paragraphs with my visualizations and how many? Uh, great question. So I think that the, um, the answer is a little bit, it depends, but I think that with uh, stories in Yellowfin and with um, Yellowfin presentation, you, you kind of have both options there. And when you're when you're telling a story, one of the things that's really going to drive the answer to that question is whether or not your story is going to be presenter led. If it's presenter led and you have an expert there who's walking through the salient points, 
but then adding depth in the conversation, there really doesn't need to be as much text. And, and you can really just kind of keep a narrative there that's very simple um, and easy to follow. Um, and then really pull the, the, the magic and the insights out of the data while you're presenting. I think that's a great way to go. If you're distributing something to an audience that is um, something the audience is going to read by themselves without the without the expert there, I think in that case you wind up needing to um, uh, put more depth in the text so that it's there and available and perhaps even share more visualizations to really back up what you're saying. Because this is something that's going to have to be simplified and really brought home, in my experience, when you're writing to people and they're going to read that themselves versus when you have a presenter-led kind of data story. In that case, you can actually be very simple with your text and just kind of make the salient points that hit home and let the expert go through and drive um, what the depth to that story is. Let's see, is it necessary to have large volumes of data to be able to tell a better story? Um, we have a kind of a funny joke around here that all of our clients believe they have uh, big data, um, but they 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 all believe that's something you know quite different. I mean that, that you know sometimes people believe it's a, a, a gigabyte of data. Some people believe it's a trillion records. Um, so a large volume of data is is kind of subjective. Um, I think that you don't need probably just a ton of data to tell a story. What you really need is to have organized it so that you can summarize it. I think if you have thousands of records of data and that data has tremendous organizational value or business value and you can really understand what questions people would be asking about that data, I think you're already ready to tell a data story. Um, in many cases, prior to this age of big data, before the, what was it, the 2004 um, MapReduce paper by Google that really kind of, you know, kicked this whole thing off, um, I think that, you know, we were often dealing with thousands of records in a database or something like that. And there was a lot of valuable information we could have gleaned out of that if we had the kind of tools available that we have today. Back then we only had, you know, Cognos or MicroStrategy. And, um, and those tools were so prohibitively expensive, people in the mid-market really couldn't access them. And now this whole kind of business intelligence thing has been democratized. And I think there's every reason to believe that with those small data sets, I do it all the time you can still tell a great story, but the information has to be of organizational value in order to do that. And it has to be something people don't otherwise have access to those summaries on. So when you have information like that, and you can collect it and you can better kind of slice and dice it, uh, you can definitely tell a great story with, with small data. I don't, I don't think there's any need for um, a, a big data story behind uh, being able to tell a data story. So having said that, your data certainly needs to be broad enough, often it might have to come from multiple sources and be matched, it still might need to be processed and cleansed under the hood, but it doesn't have to be a large data set. Okay, are there any data storytelling best practices? Um, yeah, I think, you know, there are, there are a few different um, uh, authors out there on data storytelling, um, and you can go to, a, I believe it's datastorytelling.com. I'll find the link in just a moment. But um, but if you were to go and look at some of the people, oh, effectivedatastorytelling.com, that's it. That's the that's the URL of a, of a fellow who's actually written a book on it and really going through the practices. So for the motivated reader, you should go, you know, check out that site, check out the book. Um, I personally have boiled it down to just a few points because what I see when I go into a client site is that they are starting with the data they're starting with, here's the data I have, how can I summarize the data for the data's sake? And then I'll start sharing it with people. And you go in and you start looking at what they're doing and asking people, how often are you looking at what they're producing? And even though they're spending a ton of time cleaning that data and getting it ready and putting it out in front of people, it's just not used. Um, the real challenge I think that I would overcome just as the first best practice you can implement is to first make sure you're answering a question with that data or that you are developing an insight that relates to a point you wanna to make to the organization, the business. Um, I think that if you can come up with answers to high value questions with the data that you're looking at, that is the, the first best practice, the most, the most first principle of the project that you could be working on that you would actually be able to publish to someone is to answer a question that's of some business value. 
Um, when people go in and start trying to just summarize data or make it available to people without a clear sense of the question that they're, they're trying to answer or the insight they're trying to produce a value to the organization, that's where they wind up putting out those that visual I showed with tons of pie charts and we're just showing you how all this breaks down. It, it just doesn't matter to people and, and they might glance at it out of curiosity, but if you produce a dashboard that way, what you'll see is that people log into the dashboard, they take a look at it, and then the numbers of engagement are monotonically decreasing as they just get less and less interested in looking at this. Their curiosity is going away. It's not a business value. They're busy and they're trying to do you know, things with their job. The key, the key thing I would just emphasize, if you really want to look at uh, best practices in this, please you know, start with what you're trying to accomplish. Start with the conclusions you want to draw and make sure the data supports that and then share that. If you are starting with the data and the structure of the data and thinking, how do I summarize it? Then, I mean, the universe is gonna grow very cold before you really produce something of organizational value. So you'll save yourself a lot of time, I think, doing it that way as well. But for more best practices, I would recommend that effective data storytelling.com. And, um, you know, check that out, that author is very good. Okay, so can you work with data without it being integrated? Or do you always have to integrate data before diving into it? Um, it's, it's likely, in most cases, data has to be not only integrated, but across different sources has to be mapped so that it matches well and comes to a clean set of categories that you can really draw insights from. Um, I do a lot of work with organizations that manage a portfolio of organizations. And these are like uh, uh, management companies, private equity companies um, that, that take a, 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 a serious look at the performance of that portfolio and what they're trying to do with it. And so in their case, you know, it might be that organizations across that um, portfolio name different data elements differently. And that's something we run into a lot. It might be that they, they calculate numbers differently. That's something we run into a lot. So getting that data integrated is really instrumental for us to be able to tell any kind of a story about the performance of what's going on and, and give those people a chance to drill into it. So it's very difficult for us to tell an effective data story without doing a lot of data integration. There may be some simple cases where that's not true, but in most cases, the most valuable data is where you've matched across multiple sources and you've found the entities that you really care about that need to be included and counted in your story. And you're able to say, this category is not the same as that category. Here's a change we could make to affect that. Something like that. All right, when creating the dashboard story, how do you handle an issue where there are multiple audiences for the dashboard? Oh, uh, that, is, that is a good question. And I think that um, I see a lot of times people try to make a dashboard a kitchen sink. They try to make one dashboard that's gonna go across a ton of different, um, uh, a ton of different audiences. And as a result, trying to answer every question means no question got answered clearly. So if you have multiple audiences that are asking the same question, I think that's a great place to do one presentation, one dashboard, one story. Uh, in, in, in a tool like Yellowfin, you could do all of those or any of those as long as the question is that you're trying to answer is consistent. If it's different audiences that are asking a question, but they're asking it about different categories, uh, of the data, so it's the same question, but the different categories of the data or what they really should be have that question answered for. You can use features like access filters or multi-tenant features of Yellowfin called client organizations in Yellowfin um, that would allow you to split it up by organization or split it up by departmental access, you know, geography, whatever you want to do. So in that case, you can still use one single dashboard, one single presentation, one single story uh, in order to um, present to those multiple audiences. After that though, if they're actually asking different questions, not just about different, the same question about different populations, but different questions, you've got to break that up and uh, make it so that there is one dashboard clearly answering each big bold question, maybe with a bunch of sub questions, but it's answering one big bold question that you really want to share that story with. You really want to share that story to the end. Um, I think that's important and so 
a lot of times you think of breaking it up by audience, but I really feel strongly you break it up by the questions you're trying to answer with that dashboard. And then from there, you you can determine whether or not multiple audiences could, could actually use the same dashboard. And there's some nice features uh, that allow that to happen, especially when they're looking for ways to answer that same question uh, for different populations. Uh, you can certainly use one dashboard, one presentation, one story. Okay. Next question. How do you deal with the backend databases to produce those charts? What's the level of coding you have to perform to produce them? So um, in Yellowfin, I'm going to share my screen really quick just so we're. kind of clear on what this looks like. I think it's an important point. Maybe a little delay and then. There it is, okay. So if we want to create a Yellowfin report, no scripting or programming is required. You can actually just pop into the Yellowfin report editor. Um, you can go into, uh, you know, any kind of field in the database that you've set up. And this is all with the benefit of the metadata set up in Yellowfin, which I think it has a very strong uh, showing in terms of being able to organize that data at a level that describes it to Yellowfin so that you can very quickly start putting together these, uh, these types of reports. And you can do it in a way that there are tons of defaults around the reports, including things like how things are summarized or how they're categorized and then whether or not there's something like drill available in the report. So there's no scripting or programming of necessary for this. Um, there is also, I mean, in the charting function, it'll basically, if you tell it what you're trying to do with your data, it will essentially take a guess at what kind of chart you want. Now, of course, if you want to choose the chart, you can. Yellowfin has a full complement of the different visualizations. But I think that, you know, for Yellowfin, no scripting or coding or anything like that is necessary. Yellowfin has a ton of APIs and development trapdoors that they've built in over the years. Uh, that's a very deep topic. Um, so you can use that if you're really trying to integrate Yellowfin with your platform or do something very extensive with it. But um, in order to produce these kinds of charts and visualizations, assisted insights, signals, all that kind of stuff, no scripting or programming is really, really required. Okay. Next question. Can you please repeat the name of the article? Oh, yes. Uh, it's EffectiveDataStorytelling.com. And the, the book is the same name. Ah, when you want to do data storytelling, would you use infographics or dashboards to base your stories on? So I think that infographics are great if your story is fairly concise and you want to publish it as a one-time event. Hey, you know, this happened and then, you know, this occurred and this changed and then this is the result and this should be an interesting thing for an audience. Usually infographics are, are not terribly interactive when they're, when they're just published as a sheet. Um, a dashboard, I think, is something I would look more to to um, publish as something people are going to regularly look at as part of the process. So a story that actually gets brought up over and over again as data evolves, I think that's a great place for a dashboard to be. And when um, you know when we were looking at that that Lucorio example, the dem that's demonstration uh, content from Yellow, but even though it's based on real data, it's based on the um, uh, publicly available retail liquor sales for the state of Iowa. It's, um, uh, that actually does a great job of just kind of showing how much narrative you can create in the dashboard in Yellowfin. And as that data evolves, it gets updated so that, that people can go back to it over and over again. I think that's what dashboard makes sense. Okay, next one. I am from a small startup uh, where we have just started advertising. What do you recommend for our kind of situation as far as the first dashboards or data for marketing? Well, that is a very deep topic. I think that just kind of getting started out, I would look at um, what sources um, your uh, MQLs are coming from and how much of those you're hurting. I would consider putting together some kind of a flow for that information. And the cool thing about using Yellowfin for something like that is once you start using either connectors to pull that information in or you use your background kind of 
data processing to pull that information in, let's say to, like, to a data lake or something like that. And then you're processing that data on top of that data lake in order to put reporting is you can then organize those multiples so that you can tag them with the source they came from and really start to look at the and start to look at some of the other features that might be available that would um, that would indicate whether or not someone's more likely to convert downstream, you know, into a property or lead or not. Uh, most of the time I've done this kind of thing, it, it very quickly turns into a machine learning project to really best classify who from a publisher is coming in that would be a really hot, you know, lead opportunity that, that would likely convert into something that's a, a lead that was, uh, you know, depending on whether or not you're getting paid per click or getting paid per conversion. Uh, would turn into those, you know, real business opportunities. I think that's the stream I would look at, look at for the data, and that's the kind of flow I would want to see in a particular dashboard. We very recently did this, a little bit of a different uh, domain. I'm currently working on this project actually, um, because in uh, certain medical care facilities, it has been very difficult to staff pandemic, and so everybody's hiring in some of these facilities we're looking at. And as people are coming in, they're coming in through these different job sites, you know, Indeed, and Facebook, and other sorts of, you know, job advertising places. We're doing a very similar kind of analysis to see, okay, who comes in? What do they look like? Do they apply? Are they qualified? And do they actually land? And for each of those stages that, that we want to look at in there, we want to do a better job of using it intelligence to really process that and possibly even build a machine learning model to better understand when someone comes in, whether or not we see them as fitting the profile, to kind of use machine learning almost as a filter of what we really care about and want to look at and what we're targeting. And then as they come in and they we see those conversions, we want to drive that key performance indicator that we've created for that project up so that our conversions are maximized. Hope that helped. Um, In an ever-changing world of data, how often should data updates occur for those not directly engaged in the change, the data changes themselves? That is, um, uh, that is a, uh, that certainly depends on the different populations, right? So there are some cases where we see people um, who really need data minute by minute. A lot of people think that they do, but don't. They don't make decisions on that data minute to minute, and their data isn't really coming in fast enough for anybody care about it it might be more on a daily basis on a weekly data uh, basis uh, i started my career out in financial services sub-second response times were critical in order for people to see how those um equities markets were changing in real time and they needed that to refresh uh you know sub-second on their screen so that they could make decisions um and if you look at payroll data <laughs> no one cares uh, about it you know on that kind of a uh, on that kind of a cadence and so as uh you know as the questions you're trying to answer evolve as the data that is the velocity of the data coming in at you evolves that should really answer the question of how frequently that data needs to be updated the key thing is what decision are you trying to make are you trying to make a decision that could really be impacted uh, are you trying to intervene on something that could really do something for the business on a certain time scale or is that time scale too fast one thing to keep in mind about it is as you increase the frequency of those data updates, the expense of your system and its maintenance will also increase. And so you really want to make it only what you need and nothing more. Uh, and every business has to decide that for their own questions for themselves. And so if you're looking for something that really is critical to be sub-second, obviously that's a very expensive state-of-the-art system. If you're looking for something that um, is, you know, on payroll data or something like that, that just doesn't update, you know, that frequently. And you might only need it weekly, you might only need it, you know, two times a month. Um, and you really can make more effective decisions if the data comes in quickly than that. So that's really how I slice that, uh, that challenge up. Okay, so let's see. How easy is it to lock down the story at a point in time, uh, for example, for board reporting purposes? So the only feature I've used for those kind of board reports is presentation. And um, what I've done in the, those cases is I save 
an example of the narrative as like my board report for Q1, and I save it with certain filters so that I'm always looking at that same data. And then when I wanna do the next quarter's report or the next month's report or whatever, I copy it, I change the filters, and then I go through and look at the data and think about what story do I wanna tell with this data, with this version of the data? Does my narrative really change? Um, or do I just need to give some minor updates on, you know, we thought this last quarter, now this quarter, it seems to be, you know, playing out the way we expected. So it's really a, a, a matter of saving it with filters. And then you copy it, you save it with new filters so that you, when you open the Q1 report, you open your Q1 data, when you open Q2 report, you open Q2 data, Q2 data uh, and so on. What's the advantage of using Yellowfin for data storytelling? Well, I think that if you um, are interested in a platform that allows you to extensively style in a kind of very whizzy wig environment, um, that is, you know, you, you want to use something like a Canva or an Adobe Illustrator in order to create that story. Um, and then you want to turn to some kind of publishing capability like slides and Yellowfin presentation or something more article-based like stories and you wanna have some kind of really collaborative effect with your audience so that you your presentation, you might do something that's presenter-led and you're able to interact with that data. If you do something in stories, you might wanna do um, something that's more uh, kind of in-depth that just gets shared with them, but you can still see uh, different uh, users who like that content, who read that content, and kind of get that sort of, just those metrics on what exactly you know, your engagement level is. Um, I think that's where Yellowfin's real strength is. Yellowfin has some tremendous styling capabilities, including being able to be white labeled and drop into a product. So all of those things, I think Yellowfin give, give Yellowfin a real advantage in terms of being able to present something that is strong on narrative. Um, I think that if you're, um, if you're early on in the data storytelling stages, if you're, if you're just kind of starting to create your first, um, I think those kinds of, of drag and drop features where you can get into that are, you know, what's great. What is your advice when we are considering context related to, to storytelling? I think that the, the key thing here that I, I don't mean to be a broken record, but I really feel strongly about this is that you have to get into that question you're trying to answer. If you start getting into, um, uh, uh, if you start getting into, I want to answer a question for five different audiences, and these are the five questions I want to answer, and you try to tell everybody everything, um, that is that is a really challenging approach to create a story that people are likely to engage, to have a lot of feeling for, to have a lot of interest in, and to really understand and remember. Um, I think if your context involves the question and you just make that your North Star, answering this question is my North Star as I go through this data story, um, then I think that if you can really nail that question, you're very likely to get the context right as a side effect of answering that question. Uh, let's see. Is it possible to include a Power BI analysis in the story of logging your to access the Power BI. So uh, I'll share my screen real quick. I'll just show a quick feature that is available in um, in Yellowfin Stories. Yeah. One of the things I can do here, if I want to add more to this story, is let's go up here there we go is i can actually look at different tooling reports that i want might want to put in and certainly one of those is power bi uh, click and tableau are also included um, but then i could go and use that feature in order to drop a power bi report into my uh, yellow console so yeah you can do that How can we apply data storytelling in a dashboard if the end user does not know uh, what they want? Boy, that's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. That, uh, um, for that, I think the best answer I can give is you're gonna wanna take a guess. You're gonna wanna guess at what they want to try to understand exactly what their needs are, anticipate what they might want, 
and um, give it a shot and kind of decide for yourself if that's worth the effort. Um, end users a lot of times won't give you a clear answer when you ask them what they want because they don't speak the vocabulary of business intelligence or data analytics. And so they may not be thinking, boy, if I could just have a, uh, a report that showed me the correlation between these two things, I would know whether or not I need to keep investing in both or you know, what have you. Uh, I think in those cases, um, it's great when you have somebody like that. A lot of times we don't. And um, in most of my projects, we start out with somebody who presents something very raw to me. And raw meaning that the data is, is very close to its original format and they've summarized it. And then I kind of start coming back to them with what questions are you really trying to answer? That's a process. I mean, when, when we do one of our consulting projects, it, it is a, a substantial effort for us to get through the phase where we just envision what it is we really want to answer that would be valuable to the business. And I'll tell you all of my secrets. I mean, all I do is go in and say, okay, well, let's make a table where we, you know, um, we say the, the X axis on the table is uh, how much effort we think something is and the Y axis is how much value the question would be to answer. And let's estimate where these questions land on this. And let's work our way from the top left all the way to the bottom right. In other words, the most valuable question we can answer with the least effort all the way down to the least valuable with the most effort. Um, and if we can prioritize that way, we can kind of build a backlog of the different things we want to answer. Usually, if you sit down and you start looking at the questions you want to answer, you're going to have too many questions on the list. You're, you're not going to have too few. Um, and so somewhere in that list, you probably appropriately come up with something of value to your end users if they actually, if there's actually value in the data that they can answer those questions. And so I think in that case, um, that's probably what I'd recommend is don't just come up with one, come up with a lot of questions you want to answer and then really try to just gut it out at first, kind of fake it till you make it, trying to answer some questions to see if you understand how well uh, or what their problems are and how you've anticipated the questions they would want to answer. And then once you get through that, you know, if you're if you're really far off, it may be the data is just not valuable. If you start to see some engagement, but it's not quite what you want, you have something you can, you're not starting with zero anymore and you can optimize on it. And if you really see a lot of engagement, then you nailed it and clearly understand your end users very well, better than they understand themselves. All right, let's look at the next question here. Uh, let's see, storytelling can be very custom and manual to find the story and provide insight. Do you view reporting and storytelling as separate entities or do you see storytelling as something that can be automated uh, and used to enhance standard reports? Um, I think storytelling requires human review still, even in this age where we're seeing some remarkable things out of automatic content generation. I still think a story requires human review, and you're absolutely right. It's a lot of work. Journalism is a lot of work, and that's kind of what you're doing. Um, but you're doing it on extensive, ex highly quantifiable data, right? I mean, so it's it's not like you're just doing a, a scoop. You actually have to go in there and find the evidence based on the data, which is messy and often raw and has to be cleaned. And it's a it's a tremendous effort to build a good story. And I don't want to discount that part of the work, even when you have a platform like Yellowfin to present that story and make it a very effective and powerful one for the organization. If you if you don't put that work in or aren't ready for that effort, um, oftentimes you can produce a story that is uh, just not really. Um, uh, worthwhile, and then you've kind of wasted your time. So I would be prepared for a story to be a lot of work. I would be prepared to have to really dig into that data, to really think through those salient points, uh, and to do that. When I think of standard reporting dashboards, a lot of the dashboards I put together, you know, there's a difference when I talk about answering a question, where you're answering a question with a dashboard, and you're publishing that dashboard for something people can go out and interact with and slice and dice their data and kind of get answers to their own questions, interact with it, or even if you're looking at the natural language query interface, where they can actually go in and ask their own questions that you may not have anticipated with reports and dashboards. Those kinds of things are not quite a story because you're not trying to string together that logical narrative and then hit home with a point that's supported by it. I think that's separate. I think that if you put together a dashboard that answers a clear question 
you've met your need for publishing a, da a dashboard. People can engage that and people can certainly use that. It falls a little short of a story or the work you have to do to produce a story because it doesn't necessarily have a ton of money. So hopefully that answered your question, but I, I definitely would not underestimate the amount of work that it, it is. I, I think you're spot on that it's a lot of work to put together a good story. Um, it requires a human, in my opinion, still. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's something you really have to be ready to do the investigation and the hard kind of, um, you know, data sifting that's required in order to really put together a credible and effective and engaging story. That, that, that's a, that's a, it's a real job and, um, and you can develop a talent for it. Um, but the work I think is, is quite a ways off from going away. I think it will always, will for some time now we'll be, um, you know, really looking at, uh, people to ultimately review and produce those stories. Uh, so it's manual work. I think for a dashboard or a report, you can really get something that answers a question effectively that doesn't quite tell a whole story, but it's just answering a question that the business regularly needs. I think there's value in that. And I think it's it's a little bit, it can be a little bit less work, right? Because you're only trying to make answer one question rather than string together a series of um, uh, points that answer you know questions. What is the best approach to data literacy? Ooh, uh, that's a big question. So I think the approach to developing data literacy is to start really working with it. Work with a tool you can do that data discovery in, like Yellowfin or something like that, with data that's already been kind of curated from the ground up so that you can start to develop a sense of what it's like to interrogate data and some of the challenges that come. Um, if you really want to get deep, you're going to have to get into more um, what it's like to take raw data and process it into something that is, um, uh, you know, of value. Uh, I, I've been doing that for almost 30 years, and I would say it is it is something that takes, I mean, that will take many, many years to, you know, get to the point where you're really effective at for lots of different types of data. Um, in terms of, you know, really being able to get into what it looks like to match data, what statistics looks like, um, how you uh, how you compute different kind of um, summarized data forms, uh, and then all the way out into some of the more advanced stuff that everybody talks about today, like machine learning and AI. That stuff is really a very deep topic. Uh, however, to just kind of start with data literacy, to understand descriptive statistics, you know how you how you summarize data, and to really understand how you match data and how granular data can be uh, in a report or needs to be in a report. Those are the real basic things I kind of look for when I want an audience that wants, that wants to be able to kind of interrogate their own data or even develop their own reports. Those are some of the basics that I, I certainly look for. How long does it take you to go into a business, discuss their needs and come up with a dashboard? Um, I would say it's typically, depending on the complexity of the business, complexity of the question that the dashboard answers, and whether or not they even know what that question is yet, uh, it is anywhere from a week to six weeks. Uh, for very large enterprises, I have had, um, sometimes we really have to go through it. Uh, we're available, I did a, a big project for a, a big cable company in Philadelphia. And um, their product catalog was like 70,000 you know, products and they wanted to answer questions about that. There's just no way you're gonna get through that uh, in a week. Uh, even if you wanna answer very, very basic summarized questions about that product catalog. And so when you, um, uh, when you get into uh, enterprises with huge scale and complexity, uh, that dashboard could take a lot of time just to get the data organized in a way that everybody feels you know, comfortable that they're getting the summaries that they want. And oftentimes you find what you initially thought was one dashboard is going to wind up being five. Um, and it's going to come from multiple data sources and you have to integrate all of that. And so the build out for that, you know, can take a year uh, for something that complex. Um, but but that's, you know, that's generally the timeline I've seen is for very small, simple projects a week, uh, all the way out to, you know, six weeks or so for, you know, much more expensive uh, and, and scalable enterprises. How would you tackle creating a data-driven culture? How would data storytelling fit in? Um, so I think that the key thing with the culture piece is that you've got to understand humans are going to drive that. So you have to get the humans on board. Um, there are 
<clears throat> no really well-defined formulas. There's some great stuff that's been put out by um, Harvard Business Review, I think in the last uh, couple of years around how you bring humans into the data culture. But you've got to start producing something that they're going to engage in and value from. And so I think that um, what you have to start with is from that top left corner all the way down to the bottom right hand side of that graph I discussed, what low hanging fruit do we have to add a lot of value to this organization? So we start building that uh, momentum to get people on board. I think to build um, a really good data culture, you have to have a kind of um, a, a kind of two sided approach where on the one hand you're bringing people into the data culture but at the same time you're bringing the data culture to meet them where they are and provide some value so you're building a little engagement and then you go back to the people and say i could build more if you get a little on board and you go back to the data piece of it and get a little more value out of that and you just slowly but surely can build it up and you're almost kind of doing the um you know you're you're after kind of the smallest thing you can you can find to knock something out, to add a little bit more to the culture and add a little bit more to the organization so they're starting to see the value in what you're doing. I'm a big fan of bringing small things to value first rather than going in and trying to tackle the entire organization and saying, starting you know, in six months, we're all going to pull all this information from a dashboard. That is a tremendous uh, undertaking, even in a, a fairly small organization. Uh, if you want to really get it done right, learning the culture, learning how to meet them where they are and knocking out small things that bring value uh, to the culture and then making sure that they engage. Go back and learn. Did they really engage? Did they really you know, evaluate yourself objectively? Did they really engage what we produce so that we're taking small risks and small steps and getting there? And what you'll find, I think, is what I've seen is that the cultures will that, that, are, that are right for it will um, will accelerate how quickly they're adopting that data-driven decision making, data adoption. Um, their willingness to bring data into their decisions um, is going to grow and accelerate the process because now they'll start asking for things and saying, hey, I'd love to get this question answered. I'd love to get that question answered. Uh, once they start to see some value out of it. But you know, different organizations, back to the question that was asked earlier, have different levels of data literacy. Not all of them are 100% ready for a complete turnaround into data-driven decision-making and to make sure that data uh, corroborates that their decisions are directionally correct. And for those organizations, it might take a little more time. You might have to knock out some small things before some big things. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna make this my last question to answer. Oh, it's a big one. I'm interested in improving our technical reporting from performance test engineering. We seem to have a lot of charts and dashboards, but are open to interpretation and cause more conflict than consensus. Yeah, it's a common problem. Um, how to provide the exact interpretation and narrative with the right amount of data. I'm gonna kind of just go back to something, I hate to beat a dead horse, but you've got to make sure you're answering the right questions. You've got to make sure everybody's on board with that. Um, once you go through, sit down with the team, You know, start saying, hey, if I put this question on a dashboard, uh, if I answer this question on a dashboard, is that valuable? Who would like to know about that? And then once you say that question, start going through the entities that are required to answer that question and make sure everybody has a common definition of those entities. So if, for example, um, you know, I, I go back to my old formula, of if I knew X, I would do Y, right? We make sure we have a question that is answered, that we know it, and that it's actionable. I would do Y. Then once you have that and you say, okay, well, if I knew X, that a was greater than some value or something like that within a day, I would be able to do this. Then once you're able to answer those questions and you know they're actionable, you start to get with the team and say, okay, how do we define A? And I'm not joking with you. I have gone into customers who have, I have asked them how many clients they have, how many customers they have. And when they turn around and answer the question, they come back and say, well, you know, we have this many. And then, you know, um, and, and then somebody else in the room pops up and says, well, is that before we do our fraud check or after we do our fraud check? Because the number goes down every time we do a fraud check. And then somebody else says, yeah, and it's just people who have made it through the application process and have really been, have paid a bill, or is this you know, people prior to that who have just signed up? And so you find that the organization doesn't always agree on what a quote unquote customer is or some of these other entities you might, you might see. Um, and so getting aligned on what those definitions 
getting aligned on what the sets of information you need to cover are and getting aligned on that. If I knew X, I would do getting aligned on, you know, what knowledge needs to be there in order for action to be taken in business value. Uh, that's where you really get, uh, I think, some focus in those dashboards. And that why, that I would do why, gives you something of value to the organization. You can then turn around and apply quantities to that. This is this is my, you know, my 10 priority as opposed to my one priority. Um, so you can you can kind of see the actions that are enabled and how valuable they are to the organization. That allows you to build a prioritized list for those questions and then work them down from top to bottom. Okay, I'm stopping there. Thank you so much for this. I always enjoy doing these. Um, catch up with us next month. Uh, I actually will be sending out what the topic is. I've forgotten it at the moment, but um, everyone have a good day and uh, thanks for attending.